Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I'm good, Brian. It's good to see you. Uh, we got a big Saturday, the big, big Saturday at Parks coming up. We only get to say that one time a year, Matt, but you're exactly right. Uh, big card at Parks on Saturday. Grade one million dollar races are their focus, of course, besides the other stakes races. We're going to jump right into those two million dollar races. We're going to start with the Pennsylvania Derby, Matt, and it can be easily said that this has come up as one of the best races of the year, certainly one of the best three-year-old male races of the year, Matt, no less than eight graded stakes winners in this field. Yeah, one of the best Pennsylvania derbies that I remember in recent years. Uh, uh, and amongst those eight uh, graded stakes winners, there's four grade one winners, six horses that ran in the Kentucky Derby. There's no epicenter. And I've seen recent people say, well, epicenter only has one grade one win. So he's far from uh, the three-year-old champion just yet. I, I don't subscribe to, the, subscribe to that at all, Matt. I think epicenter is clearly the best three-year-old male in the country. But what you have here is you have a lot of the, 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 the next best. You have horses like Cyberknife with two grade one wins. You have horses like Taiba, who's uh, still very lightly raced and a grade one winner. Zandon, you know, if you if you take out those races uh, versus Epicenter, Zandon looks pretty good. He's never run a bad race. And then you got some other horses who are interesting, I think, uh, maybe led by Tawny Port, who is uh, kind of sneaky, sneaking up on people a little bit. But Tawny Port's run a bunch of good races in a row. Without further ado, Matt, let's jump in. We're going to start in post position order this time. We're going to go with number one, Zandon. Matt, he won the grade one bluegrass very impressively. Uh, he's uh, been third in the Kentucky Derby and the Travers since, a second in the Jim Dandy. Nothing but good races, but uh, I think people are starting to forget about Zandon having lost his last three races. Yeah, I think that's true, Brian. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, like you said, he's never won a bad race. My feeling is that, you know, maybe I'm willing to give him one more chance based on the fact that it's possible the mile and a quarter of the Kentucky Derby and the Travers is just maybe a little bit out of his range. And the cutback to the mile and an eighth, like in the bluegrass, is what he needs. And he's on the rail. He has a chance to have a ground-saving trip. So maybe there's reason to give him one more chance. Yeah, there's also a jockey change, interestingly. They uh, they got off Flavian Pratt here and went to Joel Rosario. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and that says something if he's a, not a mile-and-a-quarter horse. And as a son of upstart, I'm not shocked if a mile-and-a-quarter is a little farther than he really wants. But that's saying something because he was third in the Kentucky Derby, a good third and a third in the Travers. But I agree with you because I think he did hang a little bit trying to get by at the center in the stretch at Churchill Downs in the Kentucky Derby and then never able to get by Cyberknife last time. He's not the only one where I think the cutback in distance could help, but certainly I think Zandon is better at nine furlongs than 10 furlongs. And again, no epicenter, Zandon has a shot in here. I don't think I can say the same for the next horse on the list, Matt. Icy Storm, I guess the morning line says 30 to 1. I think he should be 100 to 1. I don't know how much we need to talk about Icy Storm. Yeah, I agree. You've got 11 horses in this field, and we already talked about uh, eight of them having uh, uh, impressive credentials. Icy Storm, not one of them. He's not one of them. B Dog is not one of them either, but uh, trained by Doug O'Neill, he looks to have some talent. He's coming off. Uh, a good seven furlong win. In fact, he's got a couple good seven furlong wins in his career. However, uh, he couldn't do much against Ethereal Road, or, or at least he was a well-beaten second back uh, back in May, and that was his stakes try. Seems like another legitimate long shot in here. Yeah, I think so, but maybe not quite the extent of the long shot of Icy Storm. Yeah, I agree with you there. Icy Storm, like I said, 100 to 1 seems like fair odds on Icy Storm. Hey, Matt, what about Skippy Longstocking? This is a horse I've grown to like. I liked an allowance win before. I, he was my top pick in the West Virginia Derby as the fourth choice. I guess I'm patting myself on the back a little bit. 
Uh, this is tougher, though. This is a tougher field for Skippy Longstocking. Coming off two good races, in both of them, he ran down We the People. He stalked and he wore down We the People to be third in the Belmont and then to win the West Virginia Derby. Yeah, lots of good races. Uh, uh, you know, a consistent horse for uh, Safi Joseph, one of two in this field for Safi Joseph. And Safi upset the the Pennsylvania Derby just a few years ago with Math Wizard. That's right. Math Wizard was big odds in the uh, Pennsylvania Derby a few years ago. Skippy Longstocking won't be those kind of odds. I'm going to give you a little coming attraction, Matt, of the two Safi Joseph Jr. horses. I think I like Skippy Longstocking better, but I'm not sure if he's going to beat this field. The next horse on the list you could call the most accomplished three-year-old in the country, possibly not named Epicenter. Uh, Cyber Knife is a two-time graded grade one winner, a three-time graded stakes winner. And he comes off a solid second behind Epicenter. Maybe he never looked like he was going to beat Epicenter in any part of the uh, Saratoga stretch last time. But Cyber Knife still, after a nice Haskell win, came back to be second in the Travers. Yeah, and, and a nice gritty performance. And, and, and I say that in in terms of, yeah, it was clear that Epicenter was going to win. And to me, as Epicenter drew off, it looked like, and that just may have been in comparison to the winner, uh, it looked like uh, Cyberknife was fading in down the stretch and was going to drop out of this one significantly. But that wasn't the case. He dug in nicely and held off Zandon, held off Rich Strike, uh, um, has gotten better and better. And yeah, Two graded stakes wins, the Haskell and the Arkansas Derby, uh, the Matt win, an impressive set of past performances. Yeah, solid. Um, maybe he wasn't as good in the Kentucky Derby as some. Maybe he ran a bad race very early in the year in the LeCompte, but uh, a lot of good races, as you say. He's a horse who's been running every single month now for a while, and I wonder if these tough races, the Matt Wayne was tough, the Haskell was tough, and then holding off Zandon for second and Rich Strike as well in the Travers. Uh, a lot of tough races for a horse who's been running every month. Could be the favorite in here. Maybe he deserves to be the favorite, but he's a slight second choice on the morning line. Interestingly, in the Travers, that was the first time he really went out for the lead uh, as he was, uh, maybe there was no true speed in the Travers. So he tried to set the pace and he did a pretty good job to hold on for second. One horse we expect to be on the lead in this field is the six, We the People, 12 to one on the morning line map. Uh, we the People, as I mentioned, Skippy Longstocking has stalked and wore him down the last couple of times, but he was an impressive winner of the Peter Pan, the grade three Peter Pan at Belmont, three races back, fourth in the Belmont, Second in the West Virginia Derby. Not bad performances. Speed is always dangerous. That's a question for you. Yeah, speed is always dangerous. That is a good question. Uh, and for we the people, it seems like, you know, the Peter Pan, the West Virginia Derby, both on, on wet tracks, that he has a definite uh, liking for those kind of race tracks. And to me, Brian, this is the field that is not really – loaded with speed there are other horses in there that like you mentioned with cyber knife in certain situations are willing to be closer in the early going so it seems like we the people will have an opportunity to be on the lead in here i don't honestly think that's going to be enough to make him a winner no, you know, having seen what Skippy Longstocking did to him the last two times, it's it's hard to say we the people is a horse that we truly believe can wire this field. But if they do leave him alone, we the people still relatively lightly raced, getting more experienced in these big races. It wouldn't shock me if he ran a very good race on the lead. Another horse who wouldn't shock me if he ran a very good race, but not on the lead, is Tawny Port, the number seven. It occurs to me, Matt, as I look at this morning line, Zandon five to one, Tawny Port six to one. Taiba five to two, Cyber Knife three to one. The Haskell horses, the horses that ran one two in a good Haskell, are getting more credit, at least on the morning line, than the horses that ran a very good Jim Dandy uh, eight weeks ago when they were second and third behind Epicenter. Uh, I'm not sure if that's deserved, but hey, they ran one two in a, in a great one. Tony Port has never uh, 
come super close in a great one. Uh, but Tommy Port, if you look at his last four races, going back to a good Kentucky Derby is a big long shot. Uh, the, the Lexington, he won nicely before that. He won the Ohio Derby nicely after the Kentucky Derby. And I thought he ran a very good race down on the rail. It was a short field, but he was right with Zandon. And they were not all that far behind uh, Epicenter in the Jim Dandy. Now he's had eight weeks off. Why not Tawny Port in this Penn Derby? I, I, I agree, Brian. Definitely one of the, in my eyes, top four horses and, and a horse that needs to... Uh, that needs to be considered. I, I, I find it interesting, you know, in the morning line that was put out by Parks, uh, uh, Zandon is just one tick uh, shorter than Tawny Port. I, 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 I'll be really interested to see how that plays out from the betters. Uh, um, I think clearly T Taba and uh, Cyberknife are going to be the first two choices. But, you know, where is Tawny Port? And where is Zandon going to end up uh, in terms of odds at the, you know, when they go in the starting gate? Yeah. And, and, and you know, that wasn't uh, um, me trying to insult the morning line maker here because I, I do agree with you. I think the favoritism will end up with Taiba, Cyberknife 1 2, uh, either order. Probably, probably they're right. Probably Taiba is the favorite in here. Uh, but uh, Tawny Port and Zandon, if you look at the series of races they've run, uh, they deserve, and I think they have every chance to be as good as the horses that ran one, two in the Haskell and are the two likely favorites here in the Penn Derby. Uh, the next horse on that list is the horse we're talking about, Taiba. The one thing I like about Taiba, Matt, um, well, you know, he, big maiden win, big debut win, and then and then winning the Santa Anita Derby impressively and only a second career start is kind of unheard of. That was big. Predictably, he faded a little bit in that fast space in the Kentucky Derby and still finished almost in the middle of the pack there in 12. Came back with a very nice performance in the Haskell. Uh, Cyberknife was well on the inside. Tyba was well out, and Cyberknife outfinished him in the Haskell. But Tyba ran a good race in his fourth lifetime race, his first race since the Derby. There's good reason to believe that Tyba can improve off that. And, and, and I think the fact that Tawny Port and Taiba skip the Travers and have that eight weeks between their last race and this Pennsylvania Derby is probably a positive for both of them. But Taiba, as much as anyone, could be the horse that moves forward off the performance in the Haskell. Yeah, and after the Haskell, and I think before the Haskell also, uh, uh, trainer Bob Baffert, who has won the Pennsylvania Derby three times already, uh, said that he kind of felt like Taiba, Taiba, was one workout short of being in peak form. So obviously now he's had plenty of time to have all the works that he needs uh, um, and, and is certainly a serious contender. The one the one shortcoming with Taba that uh, that I hear is that he he is a horse that not just during races but in the morning needs very, very strong urging to stay on task. And I think, at some point in the stretch at, at, in the Haskell, that's something that happened that, that, that he got off the bit briefly and maybe that was enough <clears throat> to cost him position in, in the Haskell and certainly isn't something that we, you want to be happening in a very strong field in this Pennsylvania Derby. Yeah, yeah, you could say this is as strong as any fields he's faced. I know he was in the Kentucky Derby, and maybe maybe top to bottom, that had even more good horses. Uh, but this is a tough field. So Taiba, who I think, and I think a lot of people think, could be the most talented horse in this Pennsylvania Derby, uh, he can't stumble. He can't make any mistakes now in what is his fifth career race. So uh, certainly one of the uh, most likely winners of the Penn Derby, but uh, Taiba has to bring his A game to beat this field. We got long shots on the outside, and I, I think they're all going to be longer than the morning line suggests. Simplification 10 to 1, Naval 80, Aviator 20 to 1, White of Barrio 8 to 1. I, I, I think you'll get longer odds on all of them. Simplification, a um, lot of good races in Florida early on for trainer Antonio Sano, uh, and a good Kentucky Derby. He was behind uh, Epicenter and Zand in there, but he was fourth, uh, a solid run in the Kentucky Derby. Disappointing in the Preakness, he had an excuse that day, uh, uh, coming back bleeding, um, got a little time off, and then ran in the West Virginia Derby. And maybe he has excuse in the West Virginia Derby, 
when he was well beaten by both uh, Skippy Longstocking and We the People when it came up a wet track. Yeah, could be, Brian. And, you know, I don't know. There's something in me that that makes me feel like eventually simplification is going to put all the pieces together. I don't know if it will be this uh, this three year old year. Maybe it will be as he uh, as he gets older, but he's going to have to get back to his best races as when he won the fountain of youth and maybe even improve a good bit from that to be considered a win contender in this field. I don't know. Maybe he's got a shot to get a piece of the try or the super at what you're saying. And I agree is probably going to be a higher price uh, than the morning line. Matt, everything you just said, I agree with. Uh, when handicapping this race, I thought, well, simplification is a horse who could come back with a better performance than we've seen. But yeah, the Preakness performance and the West Virginia Derby performance certainly aren't in the neighborhood of winning this against this field in the Penn Derby. But even if he runs back to those good races in Florida and the Kentucky Derby, I'm still not sure that he is a horse that can win this race right now. But if he does improve, he's a horse who could hit the board and yeah i'm thinking more along the lines of 15 to 1 for simplification naval aviator 20 to 1 he's not going to be 20 to 1 in here he's going to be much higher having said that there's some things i like uh he was a former uh turf horse or he was running on turf a little bit not looking really good he was claimed out of a out of a win at churchill downs he came back with another win at churchill downs and i think both of those were pretty good then he went up to Saratoga, did, did not have a good trip in an older allowance field, but was clearly second best behind a good older horse and keep me in mind. Naval Aviator at 50 to 1 or so in here interests me as a horse to throw into the exotics as a, as a bomb. Interesting horse, yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> claimed by Joe Sharp for $50,000 and has done very well for uh, Joe since then. And, uh, you know, uh, I agree, Brian, uh, uh, that allowance race at Saratoga, when you throw in that it was a second place behind Keep Me In Mind, who has moved to the barn of Todd Pletcher and seems to be moving forward uh, from that, uh, makes Naval Aviator an interesting, definite, definite long shot. Yeah, and, and I don't even know if Keep Me In Mind, uh, the four-year-old, the good four-year-old, is good enough to win against this field, this really good field in the Penn Derby, but you'd have to give him a serious consideration as an older horse. And, and Naval, Naval Aviator ran a good race there. So yeah, he's my bomb to include in the exotics. White Barrio, eight to one. I can't see him being bet down to eight to one. Uh, he was almost that high in the Haskell and he did not run a lick in the Haskell. Better things before for White Barrio, but um, Lately, not as good. The Derby wasn't good. The Haskell was downright bad. And in the Ohio Derby, I thought Tawny Port was a better horse. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's curious to me. Uh, um, White Barrio is, the, of course, the other uh, horse for Safi Joseph in this field, winner of the Florida Derby, grade one winner. I find it interesting that White Barrio was up in Saratoga all summer long, training regularly up there, did not run in a race, but, you know, was working well uh, on the, the surfaces at Saratoga, which are rather deep. And, and I don't know, there's a part of me that, that wonders if training on that deeper track at Saratoga is going to make White Barrio a little bit better on surfaces different than Gulfstream Park. I don't know. Maybe I'm just making up a story here. But uh, and and even if he runs better, uh, is he going to win the Pennsylvania Derby? I don't know. But uh, I think at some point he'll get the pieces back together. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, my feeling is if he gets things back together, that Ohio Derby second to Tawny Port is still not good enough here. And uh, yeah, White Barrio is uh, is a long shot for me in this field, even though he's a grade one winner. All right, Matt, we spent a bunch of time on that Pennsylvania Derby. Let's jump to the Phillies. It's a little bit smaller field, but once again, it's pretty deep with talent. And uh, this is a nine horse field. You have a clear favorite on the morning line. I, I don't know how clear a favorite Secret Oath will be, but she deserves to be the favorite. 
um, say what you will, you know, she's not been as good as when she won the Kentucky Oaks or maybe even those monster wins in stakes races down in Oaklawn Park earlier this year. But still, the fourth with the trouble trip in the Preakness and then second grade one races at Saratoga behind Nest, she deserves to be the favorite here. Oh, she does, Brian. And 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 as you mentioned, uh, running second behind Nest, you know, and Nest has certainly turned into uh, a very, very, very good filly. And uh, before that, uh, like you mentioned, the Kentucky Oaks uh, – victory uh was so impressive and, and and earlier in the spring and the late winter secret oath was so strong she had a pretty extensive uh campaign at this point yeah and, and i and i'm getting the feeling you think that could be a negative here and and i i do agree i think it could be a negative something along the lines of what i said with cyber knife uh but still even after uh the kentucky oaks she's beaten horses in this field she's beaten most of the the horses in this field cutting back in distance from a mile and a quarter all the way to the mile and 16th of the million dollar cotillion I, I think is a good thing especially since there's some speed in here for her to make that uh, explosive move that she's known for uh so I, I think she's the one to beat it'll be interesting to see the odds i'm not buying this morning line for a lot of reasons but i think she is the favorite and the one to beat considering everything she's done this year Next on the morning line is Adair Manor, and I'm not sure why she's the second choice on the morning line, other than the fact that maybe she's trained by Bob Baffert. Um, she won her maiden, and she won the Las Virginias by a pole, and people thought she might be the best real filly in the country. But then in the Santa Anita Oaks, grade two, and the Black Eyed Susan, grade two, she was second as, as a pretty clear favorite in both, and now she's been off for several months. Maybe Baffert will have her ready to come back big, but... I don't see enough in her past performances to jump on the Adair Manor, especially if she's the second choice in this tough field. Yeah, I agree, Brian. And, and hey, you can't discount the Baffert factor, you know, on these big days in Pennsylvania. He's had so much success there. Uh, but I agree, this this is a tough field of nine to, to come into off of a long layoff and expect to be a win contender, or or maybe I should say a horse that I'm interested in on, in on top at what what I think will be short odds. Yeah, four months off coming against this field, and even, even her previous races, I don't know, was ever good enough to win this. She's a threat. She could prove me wrong, but uh, seven to two, no thank you. The third choice on the morning line, I, I'm also not on really at all, and that's Goddess of Fire. She's one of three from trainer Todd Pletcher, Matt, and, and I'm not sure why she's the favorite of the three, other than, other than she's coming out of a grade one Alabama where she finished third. Uh, she's lost a bunch of races in a row since winning her maiden. Sure, they're all stakes races, but there's nothing there that makes me think that she beats this field either. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, I guess to me, it's a little surprising that Pletcher has three horses uh in this field he's not usually real keen about sending horses down on the to parks on these big days but like you said uh, um third in the alabama uh, i guess okay but but then she also wasn't able to win that wilton stakes at saratoga um to me uh, uh not my favorite of the three pletchers yeah, she's my least favorite of the three Pletchers, actually, and she was well beaten in the Kentucky Oaks uh, uh, by Secret Oath, of course. My favorite of the Pletchers three has to be the fourth choice on the morning line, and her name is Green Up, Matt. Green Up ran a very good race way back when, when she rallied for second in a uh, fast five furlong maiden race at Churchill Downs last May, almost a year and a half ago. Uh, we didn't see her again. Uh, until uh, March at Gulfstream Park. But Greenup has been absolutely terrific for trainer Todd Pletcher in four races this year. She's building up the class that she runs in. She comes off a nice win over the track against a good filly in Interstate Daydream. There's a lot to like uh, Greenup. Uh, I think uh, Irad Ortiz Jr., by the way, has two interesting mounts, six to one on the morning line in Tawnyport and Greenup here in the Cotillion. 
Yeah, I agree, Brian. This looks like a horse that's getting better and better. It looks to me like a horse that maybe we haven't seen the best for. Uh, and to me, very interesting. The the races that uh, Pletcher has put her in, very interesting to me that uh, Todd sent her to Parks uh, for the Catherine Sophia, which she won. It seems like he had a clear goal, and that was this cotillion. Yeah, she's she's had some some spacing in those four wins, but she's done it at different distances, different tracks, and she's getting better with each start, and she's facing better horses. Interstate Daydream would be a horse we talk about at least a little bit. She beat Adair Manor uh, earlier this year in the Black Eyed Susan, and uh, Greenup treated her pretty badly down the stretch of the prep for this, the Catherine Sophia. So Greenup uh, is a very interesting horse. The only thing I don't like about Green Up is I'm just not buying that six to one morning line. I, I think she's going to be lower. We'll see. I'm hoping that she's close to six to one at least. Two horses in here, or three horses in here, at eight to one, Matt, and we should talk about all three of them as three more candidates to win the Cotillion. Seven uh, legitimate graded stakes fillies in this. First is Gerrymander, eight to one. Kind of an in and outer for me, Matt. Uh, when she wins, it's been at Belmont generally, one turn at Belmont, uh, nice races like the Tempted last year over good fillies, including Nest. And the Mother Goose was a very good performance at one turn. But then she throws in the other races that just don't look as good. I'm wondering if she's better at Belmont or better at one turn. Um, eight to one seems high, though, for a horse who won the uh, Mother Goose impressively two starts back. Yeah, well, the mother, mother Goose got four seconds uh, going right now, and, and maybe that's telling with those second-place finishes piling up uh, uh, this year uh, for Chad Brown. Um, but I think I like others better. Yeah, I, I do like others better too, but she's the one that could pop up. Uh, mile 16th coming out of a mile and a quarter. We'll say it again. She could be one of those Phillies – or one of those horses running in these two big races on Saturday that really appreciates the cut back in distance. Another one that's interesting to me, man, she's been interesting to me before she ever got to this country. That Her name is Shahama. Shahama was a monster in Dubai, winning four impressive races at Maidan before coming over to the Todd Fletcher barn. Her first race in America was the Kentucky Oaks, and that's a, that's a tough place to come in first time in America off a little bit of a layoff. She didn't run all that badly um, well, too far back early, and she made up some ground. I think she's building, though. She's building up now in America, and she's gotten better with each start. Second to gerrymander in the Mother Goose, a nice win last time in the Monmouth Oaks. Yeah, nice win in the Monmouth Oaks. Another whore, another uh, three-year-old filly that uh, Pletcher shipped away from uh, Saratoga to, to, to get a win, but I guess you can't blame them when you know you've got a horse like Nest in your barn. Yeah, and the Monmouth Oaks was not a weak grade three. She beat some decent fillies in that Monmouth Oaks. So Shahama is a horse I'm looking at. And she's a filly, I think, a mile 16th, two turns might uh, might do well for her as well. The last eight to one shot is another interesting horse, Matt. Steve Asmus in Train Society. She's won four or five. Her only loss was the Coaching Club American Oaks. And the speedy filly did not get off to a good start that afternoon. Yeah, another really good Steve Asmussen horse. Uh, recently, the winner of the uh, Charlestown Oaks uh, it was fourth in the Coaching Club Oaks, won a listed stakes at Churchill Downs. So uh, uh, eight to one, maybe higher than that even, Brian? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She, I, I can see her getting bad, uh, or maybe she has the least credentials of the seven that we've talked about here in the cotillion. Um, but uh, speed is always dangerous. You said that to me earlier in the show, I think, Matt. And uh, much like uh, we the people, I think she is the most likely to be on the lead. There is Phillies in here, just like the Pennsylvania Derby, that I think could be breathing down her neck, and that might be her ultimate demise in the cotillion but uh she's dangerous at least on the lead and i think more so than we the people all right now we covered a lot with these two good fields and parks million dollars grade one let's get to the top picks how about we do the pennsylvania derby first you go first as usual sir absolutely brian um i mean kind of like last week when you and i both felt like in the iroquois it was a race where it, it just didn't seem like the time to be betting the favorites. 
I kind of feel that way with the Pennsylvania Derby also. Uh, um, yes, Cyberknife, Taba, both of them are, are, are the likeliest of winners in the field. And if they win, I, I got, I've got no argument with that. But it feels to me like Field of 11, this is a race where you should be playing against those two favorites, and I am going to do that. I, I, I was having a little trouble making a decision between Tawny Port and Zandon, but as I hinted at earlier on, I'm going to give Zandon one more chance. Yeah, I can't blame you at all for picking Zandon. I think he's got a pretty big shot in here, Matt. In fact, the three horses that I'll be using in the Pennsylvania Derby include Zandon, Taiba, who I think will move forward off that Haskell performance off the eight weeks off, and Tawny Port, who also has had some time off since a very good performance in the Jim Dandy Wars, right with Zandon down the stretch and on the rail. Uh, I like those three, and, and, I, and I had a hard time deciding which one I like best. The reason Cyberknife is not on that top three list is I think it's time for him to um, not run as well as he has been running. I think he's coming out of a tough Travers after a tough Haskell, after a tough Matt Matt win. So I'm against Cyberknife a little bit. Again, he could prove me wrong. He's a very good horse. But Tawny Port Zandon and Tybar are the three I expect here. One of those is going to win. And I decided since I was having trouble to go with the horse who has the long stats, Tawny Port, feel like he should get a good trip. Uh, as Zandon should, being able to rally a little bit. But I think Tawny Port might be running best of all at the end in this nine furlong Pennsylvania Derby. Matt and the Cotillion, I see we're on the same filly. We talked about her a lot already. Karina just looks like a, a developing star for trainer Todd Fletcher. She's your top pick, I see. Yeah, absolutely. I like the development. I like like we said earlier, looks like a, a very talented and, and up-and-coming filly. And I really like the victory over the park's racing sur surface to prep for the cotillion. Yeah, and as I said, I think Secret Oath is the filly to beat. She's the deserving favorite for all she's done this year. But like Cyberknife, she's had a tough campaign. This seems like Green Up is building towards a big performance here. And I like Green Up best as well. I'll throw Shahama in a little bit uh, for some odds as well. The other Pletcher. Uh, so maybe green up over Shahama and Secret Oath for me. So we agree on that one, and we we kind of agree on the Pennsylvania Derby again, trying to beat the favorites with two, I think, pretty good candidates in Zandon for you and Tawny Port for me. All right, Matt Shipman, well done. Nice weekend of racing at parks. Many other stakes besides these top two. Let's get a parting shot from you before we go. Yeah, absolutely. This uh, Pennsylvania Derby, the last – race for three-year-olds only around two turns this year. I don't know if it's going to have any impact on the Eclipse Award, but have a great uh, Saturday of racing at Parks. Ten stakes races on the card. Yeah, and I think there's to be money to be won here with vulnerable favorites, and Matt and I are picking against them in both. So good luck to all of you. We appreciate you watching. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do it now. Turn those notifications on so you never miss another Horse Center. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the excellent race graphics each and every week. Our friend there in Louisville. And thanks to our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Next week, we have a couple of big older male races with the Lucas Classic here at Churchill Downs and out your way, Matt, the Woodward at Belmont. We'll be talking about those. Don't miss it next week on Horse Center. Until then, good luck. We'll see you soon.